now we begin uh, the next part of our discussion. What we discuss for the next half an hour is I hope revision for everybody in class because these are slides that I have taught in CH 107 two years ago and well one third of this class was in that class as well and for others uh, I am sure you have studied this in BSc, but uh, we require this to go to the uh, next step that we have. So, now what we do is now that we have done a little bit of sketchy discussion of how spectra are recorded. Now, we go on to discuss uh, actual spectroscopy of certain kinds and remember the questions that we are asking to start with is how do you determine pa molecular parameters. In quantum mechanics you have studied things like uh, bond length, bond strength, right bond angle. Now, uh, okay, those who have been in my class uh, for them again this is a cliche, but Max Planck had said that everything I mean the experimental results are the only truth. Everything else is poetry and imagination, not to undermine poetry and imagination, but we should be able to see things experimentally. How do I determine experimentally how strong a bond is? How do I determine experimentally what how long a bond is by spectroscopy? And the first kind of spectroscopy we are going to discuss tells us how long a bond is, bond length. And that spectroscopy is rotational or microwave spectroscopy, right. Of course, at least once in the class I should show you the entire electromagnetic spectrum so that I have a clear conscience. Now, I can never remember all this, so you also do not need to remember, but you kind of know what it is. Uh, we are focusing in this part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The most important relation as we have said 3 4 times already in this class is your uh, Bohr resonance condition. H name equal to E 2 minus E 1. Different parts of electromagnetic radiation come in resonance with different kinds of energy gaps. This is the first one that we see we write in terms of energy frequency of time scale. U V is these are the values right. Just look at the, uh, the frequencies 10 to the power 15, 10 to the power 12 this is what we discussed in our uh, when we talked about your Fourier transformation and microwave is 10 to the power 9 hertz ok. These are the kind of frequencies. Now, UV visible essentially is uh, when you do UV visible spectroscopy, you explore those electronic levels about which you have studied in detail in your quantum chemistry class at stage 4 to 5. IR and microwave discuss nuclear motion. IR talks about vibration, microwave talks about rotation, ok. And the reason why we can neglect one kind of spectroscopy while dealing with another kind is provided to us by uh, this born oppenheimer approximation. I believe uh, born oppenheimer uh, approximation is known to you. What does it say? What is born oppenheimer approximation? Yeah, can we rise above a murmur? Okay, Manthan, tell us. So, what Manthan is saying is that when, when we consider movement of electron we can neglect the movement of nucleus because they take place in different time scales, right. So, in other words what we Born Oppenheimer approximation says is that this problem is completely separable. You can separate different parts of the component. So, Hamiltonian is uh, sum of different Hamiltonians, wave function is product of different wave functions. So, when that happens you can as you know separate the problem into uh, different components and you can worry about one problem at a time. Of course, Born Oppenheimer approximation does not always hold. Breakdown of Born Oppenheimer approximation is not all that uncommon, and when that happens, things get a little more complicated. But to start with, at least, we are going to work within the ambit of Born Oppenheimer approximation. So, what we do is we pretend when we talk about rotational spectroscopy, we pretend that the molecule is rotating and not doing anything else. We do not worry about anything else. Let us go right away to the rigid rotor model. We are talking about a rotating molecule. Uh, to keep things simple, a rotating diatomic molecule, ok. And to do this, we first of all need to build a model that, that fits this situation. And the simplest model when you have a, a diatomic rotor is a rigid rotor model, right. Once again, we have studied this in physics course 11 and 12 rigid rotor, two bodies connected by a rod rotating with respect to each other, ok. Two body problems are always uh, well, it sounds very funny if I say two body problems are problematic, but 
So, let us say uh, two body problems are not easy to solve right complex. What do we always do whenever we have a two body problem? We try to reduce it into a one body problem and in case of rotation it is not very difficult to reduce it also. How do you reduce a two body problem to a one body problem? By, by the use of center of mass right and uh, what is called reduced mass right. Yeah. So, let us say this is our molecule HCl we want to study it, two body problem. It is not very difficult to reduce it into the problem of a single body with reduced mass mu rotating about a massless center with radius of the circle being radius of gyration. Any question? Okay. Okay. Radius of gyration say R0. Now, of course, a spectroscopy as we said is quantum mechanics in action. So, first thing that you have to do is uh, set up Schrodinger equation and what you need for Schrodinger equation is you need a wave function and you need a Hamiltonian. Now, you people have studied hydrogen atom problem, right? Hydrogen atom problem is a central field problem. So, it was expressed in terms of your spherical polar coordinates r theta phi and in this r was a coordinate of one kind, it was a length and theta phi together since both are angles essentially they make up another kind of coordinates that is angular coordinate, right. So, now see when we talk about something that is a rigid rotor, it is rotating with unchanged r 0. Would we agree if I say that the Hamiltonian is going to be identical to that of the angular part of the hydrogen atom problem? same Hamiltonian that we have in hydrogen atom except for the fact that if, uh, if you remember the uh, hydrogen atom Hamiltonian, uh, what is the r part of the Hamiltonian? It has a del del r and del 2 del r 2 things like that right. Now, if r does not change, what will be the first derivative or second derivative with respect to r right. So, r is not changing at all. So, we do not talk about it. So, what we are left with is that del del theta del del phi kind of terms. So, the Hamiltonian that we have essentially boils down to the angular part of the Hamiltonian that we had for your uh, hydrogen atom problem, okay. What will the wave function be? Hydrogen, what is hydrogen atom wave function in the simplest possible term that you can think of? Now, when I say simplest possible term, do not tell me psi. Huh? It is a product of an r dependent part, theta dependent part, phi dependent part. Is that right? Remember for hydrogen atom, what did we say? Psi equal to r dependent part multiplied by capital theta which is dependent on small theta and capital phi which depends only on small phi. Now, when I try to talk about a rigid rotor, I do not need this one right, right because r is fixed. The only parameters that I have are theta and phi yeah. So, the wave function that I essentially have is capital theta multiplied by capital phi okay and as you know this is called spherical harmonics. Right. So, we already know what the Hamiltonian is, we already know what the uh, wave function is. Now, let us think what the equation would be. Does anybody remember uh, what the angular part of hydrogen atom wave function stand for? hydrogen atom Hamiltonian stand for? Is it related to some physical quantity, angular part of the Hamiltonian? What phys which physical quantity would it be related to? Angular momentum, exactly it is related to angular momentum. So, if I ask a little further, how can it be related? So, it is an operator, right? How can it be related to the angular momentum operator and how can we get energy from there? 
Okay, let us see if you remember this. Do you remember that this L square operator operating on y which is function of theta phi, what does that give you? What is the value of square of total angular momentum? L into L plus 1 multiplied by h cross. We all remember this. Here what we will do is just to remind ourselves that we are not talking about hydrogen atom, but we are talking about rigid rotor. We are going to write not L, but J, capital J. So, this would give you J into J plus 1 multiplied by h cross square. Do we all agree with this? If there is a question, please ask. No question. What is J? J is the rotational quantum number. Which quantum number of hydrogen atom is it analogous to? L. What are the possible values of J? J 0, 1, 2, so on and so forth. Okay. Now, let us see if, if we can write the expression for energy. Now, if you remember your rotational dynamics, what is the relationship between rotational energy and angular momentum? L square by 2i, is not it? L square by 2i, what is i? Moment of inertia and what is that? Mu r 0 square, very good. Do you understand what I am writing? Energy, rotational energy is given by square of angular momentum divided by 2i, where i is your angular momentum which is, no, what am I saying? Moment of inertia, moment of inertia which is equal to mu r 0 square, okay. So, on the left hand side, so this is my equation anyway. On the left hand side, if I divide by 2, uh, 2i, I should divide the right hand side by 2i as well. So, I will divide right away by say 2 mu r 0 square, okay. Let us expand a little bit j into j plus 1 multiplied by h square divided by what is h cross? h cross is h by 2 pi, right? So, h cross square is h square divided by 4 pi square, 4 multiplied by 2 that is 8, 8 pi square mu r 0 square. Uh, there is something that I did not write and nobody corrected me. Yes. So, this is my equation. From here, what I can write is energy for rotational level j is given by h square divided by 8 pi square mu r 0 square multiplied by j into j plus 1 and this is energy in say joule, okay. Are we so far so, so far so good, right. Whoever has studied uh, rotational spectroscopy I think knows this by heart anyway, okay. Now generally in rotational spectroscopy we prefer to work not with energy in joule but wave number, centimeter inverse. How do I go from energy to wave number? E equal to h nu, yeah, equal to h c nu bar. So, nu bar should be E by h c. So, you do not have to remember anything really, you can just work things out if you forget. So, if I want epsilon j in centimeter inverse, then I just have to divide by h c and what you get is h divided by 8 pi square mu r 0 square j into j plus 1. Oh, I did not write c, I said it, okay. Now, if you look at this, h is a constant, 8 of course is a number, pi is a constant, 
c is a constant mu is a constant for a particular atom right it is not a universal constant same is true for r 0 square right. So, for a particular molecule I can call this a constant b, but we have to remember that this constant b is a characteristic of the molecule we are studying it is not a universal constant please remember that ok. So, this is your expression epsilon j equal to do not forget epsilon j is in centimeter inverse b j into j plus 1 ok. Since uh, the rest of the discussion is easy I will just quickly go through them uh, in the slides ok. This we have discussed already this is your 8 pi square i c. Now, selection rule as you know is delta j equal to plus minus 1. Next day we will start with the discussion of why it is delta j equal to plus minus 1 even that will come from the wave function ok. Now, for that uh, you should do some homework in case you have forgotten you should uh, uh, go back and read your hydrogen atom notes once again hydrogen atom is very important it keeps coming back to haunt you again and again. Uh, you need to remind yourself what is actually the form of the theta dependent part of the wave function can you tell me this theta dependent part into r dependent part of wave function right that what am I saying theta dependent part into phi dependent part. Huh? So, phi dependent part I remember it is e to the power i m phi what is the theta dependent part of the wave function which polynomial huh? Laguerre, Hermite, Legendre none of the above Legendre polynomial right these polynomials were named after a mathematician who was a legend. So, his name was Legendre no not really his name was Legendre he became a legend uh, nothing to do with each other right let him let him alone do not. Uh, so, Legendre right these are Legendre polynomials do you know achha, Legendre polynomial in what for this wave function is it Legendre polynomial in x or y or z or none of the above none of the above. So, uh, what is it in Legendre polynomial in? not theta cos theta do not forget it is legendary polynomial in cos theta ok. And do you know of the uh, recursion formula how these legendary polynomials are related to each other ok that is what we will need we will uh, discuss it next day fine. For now let us just live with the fact for 3 4 days that selection rule delta j equal to plus minus 1 is there. If that is the case delta e would be 2 b into j plus I am not done. I still need 5 minutes more delta e equal to 2 b into j plus 1 right. So, you are familiar with this energy ladder I hope this is very simple you just plug in the values of j into this expression you will see these are the exp the values that you get and the take home message from here is that energy gap keeps keeps increasing as you go higher up the ladder for a rigid rotor. And the spectrum actually goes through a maximum. Even before we talk about it goes through a maximum first thing we should uh, understand is the energy gap so the gap between lines is equal in all cases because you see this is one transition right this transition is what 2 b what is the next transition no, 0 to 6 b is 1, but then you can also have 2 b to 6 b. So, 2 b to 6 b that is the next line that is 4 b next line would be 6 b to 12 b actually. So, these lines are going to occur at 0 2 b 4 b 6 b so on and so forth the uh, gap between two successive lines will always be your 2 b. And that brings us to the application of microwave spectroscopy in understanding bond length right away because you know that b is h by 8 pi square c mu r 0 square right. So, everything else is known if you can experimentally determine b well I am assuming that you know that it is HCl. So, you know what is atomic number atomic weight of hydrogen atomic weight of chlorine then the only unknown in that case is r 0. So, right away from this spectrum you can determine the bond length 
of a diatomic molecule using a rigid rotor approximation. Okay. So, next day we will start from the question why does the spectrum go through a maximum. Okay. Now, you can leave.